We have Kelly Simon. Hello. Kelly Simon on the piano. Hey. And Carol Ann Sokoloff, who I'm going to introduce the same way I'm introducing everybody tonight, and that is letting Foster do it. And what is greater than wisdom? This woman. And what is greater than this woman? Nothing. Did you see that was Trotson? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, Translation. Okay. No, I love it. Uh, welcome. Thank you for uh, Mady and for inviting me and Bill for coming in and happy birthday. And uh, <clears throat> and and Kenny for joining uh, me on the piano. We're just going to do a few songs to start off. And this is uh, one of my favorites by Johnny Mercer and Jimmy Van Heusen. Two or three 
cars parked under the stars. A winding street, moon shining down, summer to town. With each beam, same old dream. At every step that we made, I thought about you, so much about you. And as I pulled down the shade, then I really, I really felt so blue. Picked up the track, the one going back to you. And what did I do? What did I do? What did I do? in the most appropriate fashion, we're going to read backwards through the book, which is the only way to do things properly. <laughs> Toppling forms fall where they may, happenstance. Domestic free-for-all, searching for a new equilibrium. And back to the next one. Dark brick red and black, threatening, yet the powers of light resist. Emanations from darkness, frosted fountain, and blossoms, blood red. Prospectus Prima Materia. Wood, rock, lava, canyon wall, or cavern. Oh. In the beginning, conceptual thought, molding, shaping, image making. Thank you. you. Linda. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was you, but then you didn't get up, so I thought maybe you changed your name. Well, I do that all the time, dear. It's just part of the... Um... <laughs> yes, image making. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Okay. Um, I would like to introduce Kelly Parser and the Angel of Sleep. Always when your head is turned, you aren't looking. Look another way. To catch her, she descends into cloud, flexes her fingers, feathers, pulls herself out of a hat. Ten or more fingers, feathers, one always falls asleep, loses count. Count them. Counting, she talks with her hands, wings. How many fingers, feathers now moving so fast, they disappear into a delicate wind. Do you perceive? the implied intimacy? Do you hear thrumming, slow southern sounds? Sleight of hand, wing is lulling, like so many vowels up her sleeve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She had many vowels up her sleeve, <laughs> and she's still spreading them around. And Ars Longa, Vita Breva, this is what we have. Karen Bollinger is next, and she's going to read for Gail Whittier. And I've chosen from Chaucer. Uh, her veins are bathed in liquor of such power as bring down the fragrant showers on her garden for all eternity. Thank you. <laughs> Gail uh, lives outside the trail and couldn't make it down, so I'm going to be reading some of her poems. We start on page 94 and go backwards from backwards or forward. 
Against this mountain, the language of wings is a stillness too. All the crows dressed in black silk drop from her fingers. More often now on my earth walk, feathers. Did you know she left segments of herself in the black crows? Listen for silence in the opening of sky, says Eagle. Midwinter from my window openings. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to um, I'm going to read. I think this is the last bit of the poem. Okay. Peter, think Peter Moran, and he uh, he used to hang out in the coffee shop under uh, open space. That was his office, and that's where he sat and sewed and beaded and did all this stuff. And if you wanted to meet up with him, you had to go there. <laughs> And these are magic shoes, and they have ravens on them, because raven is my totem. Once the shoes are on, they're on forever. Could be crazy blue or second skin. She can't stop dancing. A crowd black as crows gathers around her, makes sure she doesn't fall in the fire. The man in the coffee shop laughs and vanishes, goes back to his tree, and her moccasins talk all the way home. Go here, go there, she's blind in the dark, and they join her in bed under the covers. Will they, she wonders, talk all night, sleep, or make love? Make the sound of rabbits and deers of needles going in and out. Her feet go still and her shoes are silent. She waits for a sail or wings. She waits for the moon and the stars to appear. There is no other way to navigate sleep. Is there a spell that she has forgotten? At last she tries all my relations. And outside, the tree shakes with laughter. Inside, her blanket moves as new raven explores a new galaxy. Where needles went in, the light's coming through. I'm sure there are many of us who, who, who feel the continuum <coughs> that, um, that, that when we <coughs> love, it, it never ends. And I think that's what we write about. Oh, it's Bill's turn. When's your birthday, Bill? November 23rd. <laughs> Close. <laughs> P.K. Page's birthday. He always had to share it. Now he has to share his other birthday with Shakespeare. Damn. Now, you chose some damn fine writers, Bill. Thank you. Okay, for you I have chosen. No empty-handed man can lure a bird. Hmm. Jeffrey hmm. wrote that for you. It's brilliant. Oh. It's brilliant. Bill Bissett. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hey, you can just me in your higher candida. I got a feeling, uh, I got a feeling we're gonna uh, make this and strong. We got the holy breeze coming through the trees, we got the holy breeze coming through the trees, we got the all the love and our soul and our heart of Shania, all through our soul, it's a Shania, and the green wind is moving all through the summer trees. And the green wind is moving through the summer tree. And the green wind is just moving all through the summer trees. Ya kira shimaniya, haya kira shimana, haya kira shimana, haya kira shimaniya. Oh, yo ku shimana haiki. Oh, what's new? What's new? A hat on 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 a a river of gold is flowing 
and through all our hearts. Uh, 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 It's another mind, eye staring, staring into the night shining iris, the breath of the cold and quizzical, lethal teeth and tongue. Dream ghost dance. You wake up and they're still dancing. Inky blue dancer, almost diaphanous in ice and snow. Do you see through the sun? Do you see through the curve of the glacier? Sharks, meditation in the sky, and coming are coming, incoming are coming toward you. The flight and laughter of no image, no name, no representation. I wrote these in May's garden, wow. and, and I lived in her little hut, and it was very idyllic, very hot summer, and then I would come into the house after meditating and stuff, and maybe would be making food, delicious food, and then I would, she had a desk there, and she had paper there, and she had a pencil there, you didn't have to do that part. It was amazing. You know, where is the pencil? <laughs> and then each day I would write one or two of these. Uh, oh, several. Several. Always before a meal. <laughs> <laughs> Hearing the color and seeing the touch through the ribbon of becoming. What comes before words? What we see before we call anything or naming song or describe the morning sight and night glade any way call moon skies 
Say bubbles of moon air, breathe a sweeping arc in our heads. Flight of ecstasy, ung, lasting, ting, orange yellow energy climbing in the seven mist before remembering a sting, a sting, ting, in a, a giga, a giga, a giga, a tin. Those are the ones that Mady inspired me to write in mm -hmm. Fort Kelly. And there's one poem I wrote recently. I write uh, about my life on Lunaria, my home planet. <laughs> and all winter I did paintings, each two by three feet, that look larger than they really are because I have a very low ceiling in my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> and I did 20, and then I did 21, and then I did 22, and I thought I would get to 23. This took like five months. Although winter was actually 800 months. Right. <laughs> and then I thought there would be a 23rd, but there wasn't. So then I was out of the series. But it, how many people paint in series here? I had never done that before, really, and it's an amazing feeling. Because certain aspects of the paintings are the same all the time, but the variations are always really different all the time. So it's like thrilling, it's like being in a specific country, and so you're, you are somewhere. So which poem would you like about Lunaria I close with? Maybe? I think you need to choose. I like all of them. The red tubes. <laughs> oh, that's the journey to heaven. I don't have that. Well, you know, all know, the journey to heaven. First, we chill in red crimson tubes, and with excellent... Sorry. Yes, music like that. <laughs> tubes to our body and they remove all the bad memories. Oh, good thing. So, don't worry, they'll all be removed. Great. You know what I'm saying? Sounds good to me. We know it because we've been there, right, Bill? Yes. <laughs> Frequently. Yes? Is that a yes? Hello, recognition? Mm -hmm. Oh, where's the poem? Okay, excellent. Of course, there is word missing listening, and whatever we were doing, the bus driver just kept on driving, and uh, etc. And okay, so here it is. This is the one that Linda and maybe liked a lot. So I'll close with this one. Time, inspiration, breath. What do you think, stealth-like, inside your abandoned furrier? waiting for the show to open. Talking with Zebra King, and he said, I was, I am, why are you sighing? Life has already started. The only time, it's only life. It's only time. What can you? Time, Timothy, Timmy, Timaeus, Earth time, time of the soul, Rocks, trees, fire, wind, does it always replenish? Do we? Time's winged chariot speeding like the chariot ride in Ben-Hur? What's the difference between decompose and compose? How we with brightness take on, inhabit, fill out, animate all our features and moistures? apertures and mullocks, so combine as to rearrange the air, earth, wind, and fiery verbs, and the nanaries. Remember when, a, when Hamlet said to Ophelia, get thee to a nanary? Because <laughs> <laughs> her very florid speech was, too overflowing, he felt, for him, adjectives. <laughs> <coughs> that was a very disturbing part in that play, wasn't it? Yeah. You know? <laughs> and the nouneries that disclose us all for the timex of our lives, even just a glancing touch, sometimes too late we try to build a firewall around our fragile stickers all over our psyches, 
self, feelings for how long we are built to last. There is planned obsolescence in all our lives. And do we live beyond our breath? Is it continually beyond earth and while we are here? I could sit and drink water all day at 2030 below, dot, 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 inspire the breath-breathing heart. How lucky we are when it runs with us, loves with us, risks with us, our tremors, fears, and the luck of the DNA. Drawing our time, inspiration, be no one's anything if that says to work for them, working with them, and they want if they want a magic wreath around your breath somnolence around the lee side and falling, falling underneath the waters, the air inside. Where are we? Distracted? I forget the magic words where they're saying, please come and get me, please come and get me. What they're saying, don't let we stop, let us keep going on and unravel all the puzzles in all the searches as much as we can do. Zebra King said again, rocking on his assumptions, empowering himself and his listeners. The air started going on Lunaria, and we the children first were boarding the shuttles to Earth and other places, leaving the many others behind to build fires, what they could, and doing deep breathing. But the air was going, and they were dreaming ever more weakly. What would inspire as the time was drawing near and down to a close, leaving with the air until something would happen? Thank you very much. I just finally realized what it is to be a poet. We're all fitted with these crimson tubes, and we never know whether we're coming or going. It's true. And on the way, we have all these visionary experiences. It's quite amazing. What a collection of ideas and, and snapshots tonight. And now Mady is going to explain some of the, uh, them to us. Uh, of Kelly's experiences to us and visionary experience in medieval poetry and how Kelly absorbed and understood that. And for you I choose Love Conquers All because this book is a labor of love. The, her love of the paintings of Carl and the poems and the person of Kelly and she's worked extremely hard to bring it all together and we're all very grateful. Thank you so much. Yeah. And her second her second quote from Chaucer and, and gladly that she learned from that Mady Hilmo. My intent in wrapping up this series of events that um, constitute a book launch for Kelly with Love, poems on the abstracts of Carl Hesse, which are around you. Um, I was trying to, I'm trying to bring together all the different components. And Kelly, in a sense, is the center of all this. And um, as Linda mentioned, I had given Kelly some copies of some of these abstracts, but she was unable to do more than meditate on them because she was heavily influenced by pain medication in her last few months before she died of breast cancer. But as many of you know, Kelly was really a poet's poet. Um, she didn't write that much, but every word was absolutely exquisite, beautifully polished, and um, it appears in I Will Ask for Birds. Now, the cover shows um, uh, some birds from a med an early medieval, early, actually, late antique manuscript from the Vienna Dioscorides, which is a scientific treatise showing uh, various herbs and birds. And I'm calling attention to the birds because somehow um, birds keep coming up tonight one way and another, and it's in a way very Kelly. Now, um, 
She also, in addition to being a poet, was a musician, as was Carl. She played the harp, and um, Carl played the piano. She was an artist also, did some beautiful collages. She was interested in medieval writing. I remember that she had um, quill pens and parchment, and she was playing with the whole idea of learning and practicing medieval calligraphy. Um, she was many, many things. And uh, what I'm going to emphasize tonight is not only her poetry, but also the fact that she was a medieval scholar. Now, she published an article on somebody called the Red Ink Annotator in the Book of Marjorie Kemp. The Book of Marjorie Kemp is um, the first autobiography in English. It's by an English mystic. Um, and the Red, uh, it was 15th century, and the Red Ink Annotator wrote annotations and made little drawings in a copy of her autobiography. So he's reacting enthusiastically to what is happening in her life. And she was, uh, I think Bill would have loved her, she was very into strong emotions, um, a very vibrant sort of woman. She had 14 children. And uh, <laughs> she, she sort of thought, well, maybe I'd like to live a chaste life now. <laughs> and um, even after her first child, she was, um, she meditated and she had a vision. And so she had visions throughout her life. And of course, nowadays we might call that something different, but um, in her time, she took these seriously. She went on pilgrimages, and um, I will talk a little bit more about that. But the, re the red ink annotations are what Kelly wrote about. Um, it's the earliest response to Marjorie's autobiography, to, to her life. And her article was so important that now scholars all over the world refer to it whenever they want to know how Marjorie Kemp's book was received. And her article is published in this book, and it's had a second printing. So it was a very important contribution to medieval scholarship, as well as her poetry ha having had an influence with all of us here. Um, so I'm going to read, first of all, her poem, Sitting Alone, in the Hagia Sophia, or Hagia Sophia, or Hagia Sophia, whichever way you want to pronounce it. Um, so, actually, what I'm going to do is pass around a, few pic a picture oh, of the Hagia Sophia. Um, so we can start there. And since you're, um, you can see it there. Um, so, so she says, what else do you pray for? Cathedrals, for sure, and from the inside. Sunlight and all that ancient slanting dust, a streaming you've entered. The air is golden with it. And you can see in the photograph that the, the way the light slants down is very special and golden and sort of mystical. And then later on in the poem, Kelly says, um, she's talking about um, people kneeling, waiting for the temple birds to come down. So she's imagining from all these high windows that birds are coming down. From their high window, hello birds. They're breathing, your own breathing. Curling sheets of familiar music, small fat birds, little brown cathedrals of kindness for sure. Aww, so beautiful. <laughs> so, um, the, or the picture is going around. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about images because the Book of Marjorie Kent has little images in it. And by images, I mean anything that's a representation, you know, a painting, a mosaic, a sculpture, whatever. And for early Christians, this was a bit of a problem because they were trying to distance themselves from idol pagan worship. You know, pagans who had these statues and would think that the gods were in the statues. So Christians had a bit of a problem with this. And um, it, it was also the second commandment in the Old Testament against making graven images. So they had to debate this and consider what to do. Well, Gregory the Great, the first Pope Gregory from 600, said, well, images can be made for the illiterate so that they learn the stories. And then a little later, um, John of Damascus said, well, 
Images can be made of Christ because he was, God was made flesh. So you can make images of the fleshly Jesus Christ. So this was a major justification for images throughout the Christian period, although it, there were still controversies about whether or not you should make images. And um, he further suggested that images can serve as a bridge to reveal things that are hidden. And um, this helps to account for a lot of early medieval art because they were trying to distance themselves, as I said, from classical art, you know, with beautiful idealistic statues. They were looking for something interior, something spiritual. And the second, I don't know where that's going around now, I think you'll see the second image you have there is from the Book of Durrell. And it shows Matthew, or the symbol of Matthew, man. And it's a very abstract image. You can see little, the body is really a, a big blob of little squares, colored squares, almost like a jeweled piece. The head is looking forward, and if you call it a head, it's very, very simple. The feet are going sideways. There's no ground line, there's no space, no, um, there's nothing but space behind him. And then there's a frame of curling interlace. So you can see that medieval art wasn't trying to be like classical art. In fact, in many, for many artists, it was an attempt to remove themselves from classical art. And so then we come to the later Middle Ages and the, the Book of Marjorie Kemp and the annotations. And Kelly deals with how these annotations would have been received. This was during a period of effective piety. And as Kelly describes it, pious readers were counseled to imagine themselves bystanders or even participants in the events they contemplate. So they might imagine themselves, women might imagine themselves holding the baby Jesus. Or um, they might imagine themselves suffering with Christ on the cross, as if they were actually there. This kind of participation in sacred events was encouraged. And images, in many cases, help people to do that. And Kelly says, um, if I can find it here quickly, images serve as a focus for meditations and aid in their ability, people's ability to feel and experience personally what is described or shown. So you use an image, basically, um, to, as a bridge to get to another state of being. And if you're religious, of course, what you want is a celestial vision or at least some inner truth or you're looking inward. And that kind of um, brings us to the red ink annotator. And as you'll see from what I'm going to pass around now, um, I'll start over here. If you just don't mind passing them. Um, I, I'll hold this one first. Um, the drawings are very, very simple. They're in the margin. They're in red ink. And at the top, you see a uh, letter T, and it's got five little dots inside. And what this is, is an emblem of, five, of Christ's five wounds, you know, the two hands, two feet, and the side. So you would meditate, when you looked at this, on Christ's suffering on the cross. And then further down is a very simple little drawing of the fire of divine love. And um, this was something that was encouraged in meditating um, by Richard Rohl, who was another mystic, and there's a reference to him in the little annotation below the fire of love. And then below, and this is what I found the most interesting, is a little drawing of a female garment. And Marjorie Kemp speaks of having seen the virgin smock at Aachen when she was on pilgrimage. And so here's a drawing of the virgin smock. And then down below, you will see, is a photograph of the virgin smock that is still there in Aachen, in a sacred shrine. So um, there's a kind of continuum now. Pass that one. Now, the virgin smock, of course, is a um, sacred relic, presumably going back to the virgin herself. We won't go into the whole relic thing, but um, relics have an additional power 
beyond that of ordinary images because, of course, you know, they touched the divine person, the sacred, the holy person, and, you know, there could be emanations um, from the, the sacred relics. Now, I'm going to jump ahead to the abstract paintings of Carl Hesse. And um, just as, I should say, just as medieval art tried to distance itself from representational art of classical times, modern abstract artists, of course, tried to distance themselves from representational art since the Renaissance, you know. Um, they were trying to start, in a sense, with the basic fundamentals of color, texture, line, space, uh, even the movement of making art. And they also, in many cases, wanted to encourage emotional and spiritual participation, psychological participation. And in a sense, that's what I found so amazing about the poems in our book, is that almost all the, well, virtually, I think all the poets seem to, even though they were writing in isolation, seem to zero in on the same sorts of things. So you'd have bridges, openings, windows into some hidden space, some hidden truth, something beyond. And um, I was really stunned by that because it brought together so much that was Kelly, that are the poets, that are the abstract paintings, in a way that I had never seen. You know, I couldn't have planned it better had I said, okay, this is what you're going to write about. <laughs> so um, I'm going to have a look at a few poems in the book. And since um, Linda Olson isn't here today, she's now in Newfoundland, she's another medievalist. This place, this book, and every, a lot of people here um, are medievalists or interested in medieval things. So um, she's talking about the abstract on page 117, which is actually over there. Um, so on page 116, if you haven't had the book, it's called Pomegranate Wings. I see you painted flesh pink on my heart's canvas. So she's talking about Kelly here. And notice how she immediately goes to inside, to the heart. I see you, and the idea of vision. Your face is bowed a little to the snowy page. The story is sad, sharp steel and red horses. But you're smiling. You know words can waft truth, light as feathers on a blood-ripe wind. A bone cage might soften with fruit at its core. Even harp ribs can sigh if the tempest cuts deep. We keep dancing like quills, Afraid to rise and read the flow, but you are there above the ink, Magdalene soaring on her pomegranate wings. So that's Kelly. Mm. It reminds me of Karen Ballinger's poem uh, in the book on page 68, um, where the abstract inspires the idea of an egg and she reaches in and cracks open the truth. So, um, I, I was expecting you to read your poem tonight. Do you to want to come and sure. read it, please? Sure. Thank you. So that's mine. <laughs> it's a privilege to be in this book. Mine's called Light at the Center. It's on page 107. And it's, I think I found it over there on the wall. Yep. Um, it's a, <laughs> somewhere over there. <laughs> it's hidden in there. Light at the center. In the deep moments, the city is dark with grief. But there is light at the center, an animated a joy. Faces in conversation, a woman sings. Flags blaze glory, and a bridge appears, spanning a chasm of unknowing, bright with the possible, brightness at the core. Flag rays stream, a bridge spans the chasm of unknowing, 
bright with the possible, brightness at the core. Like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she starts in darkness, sees the light at the center, and um, this whole business of the chasm of unknowing is very powerful. I don't know where it came from. <laughs> I liked it, that picture. That's what came up. Yeah, yeah. I looked at the picture and somehow it was there. And that's what, I didn't even know that the pictures, that the paintings had some kind of unity in that way, right. even though the techniques are Right, different. so it took the poetry to bring that out. Yes, and painting. that's why I think this book of poems on the facing painting is better than an art critic's estimation and discussion and tearing apart of, of the paintings. Because yeah. the poets are sensitive, they're creative, they can get into the creative spirit of something like these paintings. I think that's just the best thing. Anyway. Um, so Corinna on page 78 again talks about a bridge. I mean, you people could have read John of Damascus. It's really extraordinary. And Linda Rogers, of course, um, the abstracts encouraged a kind of state of transformation in the story the making of the moccasins and I'm glad she read the last poem where needles went in the lights coming through mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. same idea mm -hmm. it just keeps on and, um, I'm going back to front too I don't know we're all going back to front <laughs> <laughs> um, Gail Witter's poem which um, Karen read so nicely um, she looks through a window and sees openings, that's on page 104, and it reminds me of Bill's poem, Do You See Through the Curve of the Glacier? Again, right. going into this other state, other dimension, and um, again, Gail Witter, um, this is on page 102, and she says, listen for silence in the opening of the sky, mm. says Eagle. So we're getting back to birds. But that reminded me, when I was studying in London, England, Dr. Gavernitz, who had escaped from Germany and um, set up at the Courtauld in different places in London, um, taught me three religions, I think, early religions. Um, and, you know, as I got to know her a little better, I once said to her in the British Museum, well, what do you believe? Because I thought, well, she knows all about these old religions. I mean, she must have a direct line there somewhere, and she said, listen, that's all she said, wow. so here, listen for silence, so Sam comes in, in silence, listen for silence, but there's a duality, and there's also darkness, the forest or mountain represents something threatening, something fierce, beyond human control, something internal or external, or supernatural, and that reminded me, for those of you who are medievalists, of the road, the way to Grendel's lair, if you remember the description um, of the way going there, or when the Green Knight um, goes to find the barrel, similar descriptions are happening there. Terence Young's poem, Observations, on page 74. Here the, we go from beyond to extraterrestrial. Actually, that's where <laughs> Bill comes from too, right? From the area. Um, so he imagines, seeing the picture on page 75, astronomers who are weighted to the Earth but are looking through telescopes into space at the moons of Jupiter. Now this particular painting of Carl's was part of a future world um, project which was um, a Canada Council Explorations Grant thing. Um, and there, it was also part of an astro astronomical exhibition here. We won't go into that right now. Um, and then we come to Grace Sutherland's poems. He wrote some here, or wrote, read tonight. And sometimes he too has a strong sense of something just out of reach, as on page 64 and 65. Um, something he's almost, he can almost access by closing his eyes, holding his breath, humming and swaying. 
But um, on page 62, um, there's something that he can't reach, but somehow the laugh of a child, which is our cover, um, Gray wrote, just like the laugh of an exultant child, discovering the truth its parents cannot see. Bill's poem, Letting the Brush Dance, is I think one of the best poems I've ever read on the process of creating action painting or abstract art. And I do encourage you to read that slowly and carefully because it tells it all. It's what abstract art is, how the poet goes about creating it, what is involved, the, um, the breath, the color, the fingers, shaping, swooping, going deeper, soaring, swooning, all in the act of creating abstract art or really poetry. So I'd like to thank you all very, very much for coming.